Thank you for joining Scarborough Guild of Representatives this evening. With us is the Honourable Member of Parliament, John McKay, Member of Provincial Parliament, Mitzi Hunter, and City of Toronto Councillor, Paul Ainsley, with special guest, Liz Buller, President and CEO of Scarborough Health Network. Thanks, thanks uh, everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you for the introduction. This is Buller of the uh, President and CEO of Scarborough Health Network. It really is a privilege to be uh, joining as the guest this evening. Uh, I've been with the Scarborough Health Network for the past three years. Uh, a lot has gone on in, during that time and uh, in particular in the last few months uh, with our pandemic and uh, how we're overseeing and helping to support the community. Our, our vision and, and goal is to make sure we're transforming the health of the community uh, and it's a privilege to be able to communicate with you tonight and, and uh, hear some of the questions and concerns uh, that are in our community that we can uh, both address imminently and or take away uh, to uh, look into further. So thank you for the uh, opportunity to participate this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, thank you for sending us your questions in advance of our meeting tonight. Uh, you are welcome to submit additional questions during the town hall by clicking the ask a question button in the lower right area of your screen. In some places it'll be on the top and it'll be on the top right. Let's begin with some questions for our guest. Liz, when will hospitals reopen for treatments like fistula sur surgeries? Thanks for that question. We are working on the ramp up right now of, of how do we reopen uh, to full services. It's a very delicate balance of uh, making sure that we have the opportunity to have uh, enough occupancy or, or rooms and spaces should we have critical outbreaks of, of patients with COVID or other uh, illnesses needing, needing admitted to the hospital. The government requires us to have a minimum of a 15% gap, so we can't have more than an 85% occupancy rate. We also have to have enough uh, what's called PPE, personal protective equipment, of a minimum of 15 to 30 days. So we're tracking that on a daily basis. And we have to be able to uh, make sure that our uh, volume of patients and uh, admitted of COVID patients is declining on a regular basis. This gets monitored weekly. We are we have started into phase one of opening up and are starting to do certain uh, procedures in ophthalmology, in cardiology, and in outpatient diagnostics uh, to start to decrease some of those wait lists. Again, we're, we're monitoring them weekly and hoping to ramp up other services as quickly as we can. Uh, and uh, hoping that in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll be expanding those further. Just to reassure people though, anyone who has emergency needs, that has been going on all the time. All of our emergent uh, procedures, uh, whether it's for cancer, orthopedics, gynecology, uh, we, we provide those uh, ongoing and our emergency department is open 24 seven and we encourage anyone who has care needs to please come to our facilities and use them. Thank you very much, Liz. The next question is, the nearest drive through testing center is in Etobicoke. Can we bring more open air drive through testing to Scarborough? We, we can explore uh, open air drive through uh, opportunities. We have two facilities right now, one at the Birchmount site and one at our Centenary. They are both mobile units, which are separate from our hospitals. So they're standalone in our parking lots. Uh, they're not drive through uh, the same way, but they are indeed uh, separated from the hospital. We're seeing about 250 patients a day at each of those sites. Uh, we've had pop-up centers throughout Scarborough, five, uh, in the last few weeks that we saw close to 2,000 residents uh, come through those. We're, we're assessing uh, the need and the situation and if we feel we can add and or need a drive through center, we will do that. Uh, we do that in collaboration with public health and the province in making those decisions, but uh, we certainly aren't ruling that out. Thank you very much. The next question is, 
Can I visit my mother in a long-term care facility if I test negative for COVID-19 every two weeks? My husband and I are seniors and my husband has serious medical problems. So it is a great risk for us to go into a hospital for COVID testing. Do you have any suggestions for, for, for us? So just to um, repeat, for, for us, our COVID assessment centers are independent of the hospital. You don't have to go into the hospital. It's a standalone mobile unit on the parking lot of both of our sites, one at the Birchmount site and one at the Centenary site. So you don't have to be concerned about going into the hospital um, if you need to get those um, assessments done every two weeks, which I know is, is very onerous and obviously you wanna get them done to visit your loved one. I also know we're looking at revisiting that criteria because it is it is quite a burden on the family to, to have that done. But in the meantime, uh, please uh, don't, don't hesitate to come to our assessment centers. They are independent of the hospital building and you're completely safe to use our assessment centers. Thank you very much. The next question is, we are seeing large second waves in the USA. Following economic reopening, how worried should we be about a surge in new cases as we move to reopen? This is a question for me again. I'm not an infectious disease specialist, so I'm going to um, uh, take the Fifth Amendment on this. Uh, mine is, I think we all just need to use um, good common sense and follow uh, the guidance of our public health officials and uh, practice what they're telling us on a regular basis. We have uh, uh, report outs every day and updates on a regular basis on how to make sure we're as safe as possible to mitigate um, the impact of a second wave. So I would encourage everybody, if you're in um, closed buildings, grocery stores, shopping malls, et cetera, use your masks. If you're on busy streets, use a mask. Don't go into large crowds if you don't have to. Practice social distancing and practice uh, good hand washing techniques and uh, maintain your bubbles a while longer. I, I, all of us, uh, I know, are feeling the pressure and getting a bit antsy and especially with the better weather wanting to get out. Uh, it'll help us with that second wave uh, that will come. Uh, we're, we don't know if it'll be a, a tsunami or, or if we'll be able to mitigate it like we have our current wave. Uh, it's been devastating for long-term care without, without question. Um, but overall, compared to some of the areas of the world, we've, we've managed it um, uh, fairly well. So I think it's 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 uh, behooves all of us to practice and uh, what our our public health officials are telling us, and to share that information with each other and um, hold each other accountable um, when we think maybe maybe we're not all practicing our, our safety standards as best as we could. Uh, Antoinette, maybe I could jump in on the, on this question as well because. Uh, the concern of the uh, questioner had to do with uh, what we see in the United States. And um, and uh, it's, how should we say, uh, to put it generously, an uneven experience. Uh, some states like New York have, um, have uh, coped ma uh, very um, heroically with, uh, with their outbreaks and are maintaining um, the advice of the um, public health experts. Uh, some states, uh, Florida in particular uh, seem to think that uh, COVID doesn't apply to them. Um, and um, and uh, so the uh, Prime Minister has uh, negotiated a uh, closure of the border further to July the 21st. I know that's very frustrating for some people, uh, but um, uh, the uh, concern is on this side of the border that the uh, management of this uh, pandemic is uneven, to put it generously, um, and um, and we cannot afford to uh, risk our own population, whether it's in Ontario or whether it's any other uh, province in the country. So um, it is a classic example of pay attention to the uh, public health officials. Uh, if you pay attention and endure the pain, uh, ultimately, the gain is very much uh, worth it. So I would uh, reinforce what uh, Liz just said about the very practical ways in which we can 
uh, flatten those curves and keep them flat. Thank you, John. The next question um, is for Liz again, um, but you're all welcome to uh, make comments. Is it safe to go to restaurant patios? We've been told to stay home as much as possible. Is that still recommended? What health precautions should people take while navigating the economic reopening? Thanks for that question. I, I would echo what I had just said. Uh, it is safe to go to patios. I believe it is. People need to get outside and we know the spread is, is less when we're outside, uh, you know, it, as long as we continue to practice social distancing. So uh, you would have heard our, our Toronto um, Public Health Officer, Alina DeVille, Dr. Alina DeVille speaking about you know, her disappointment in seeing the early openings of our patios where they were very, very congested. And I think that's a lot of enthusiasm and people just wanting to get outside. I myself have walked around my neighborhood and seen the patios are opened up and um, they have tables between tables and they seem uh, quite safe. I think it's just practicing the same social distancing uh, and again, using common sense. I will say I did see a cute little thing on social media this evening in Paris where they've got their patios open and what they've done is filled the seats in between all of the chairs with uh, humongous teddy bears. Um, <laughs> so people are in, you know, keeping the social distancing in sort of a fun way. But um, again, common sense, good, good, good corporate citizenship together, all, all holding each other accountable it is safe to be on those patios. Uh, just don't get too carried away. Yeah, and, and just for as from the municipal level, just to say that, you know, to follow up what Liz has said, we have very stringent guidelines that we put in place around the operation of patios. We've encouraged businesses uh, to reach out uh, so they can understand those guidelines if they have any questions or concerns. We just put in place a program called uh, Cafe Toronto where um, for businesses, they can actually expand their outside patios. Um, so we want to support our business community and get them back on track. And, but we also understand uh, people want to be out and about, enjoy this beautiful weather. And But saying that as well, we also have a very active uh, licensing enforcement staff that uh, will be monitoring all the restaurants and patios to ensure each and every restaurant owner is following the guidelines because we want people to be safe. Uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure a second wave doesn't come to the city, but we also need people to be responsible. As Liz said, wear their masks, follow the guidelines in the process, in the hospital, sorry, in the eating of establishments around uh, social distancing, and I think you'll be safe. I also um, just want to say that, you know, the provincial guidelines have also um, come out for stage two, which is uh, where we are now in Toronto and Scarborough. And uh, this is the third day. So this is the third day that um, restaurants are allowed in stage two in Toronto to be serving food on patios. Um, stage two does not involve uh, in restaurant dining yet. Um, we're not at that stage. And, you know, one of the things to look for in terms of a safe patio is just how how the establishment is operating. So we want to make sure that the tables are not uh, closer than six feet apart, two meters apart. Um, you want to make sure that um, the, the, the staff that's serving those tables um, observes um, good um, uh, physical hygiene, maybe wearing a mask, other types of uh, personal protective equipment you, might be evident as well. And, um, and that, you know, things like the washrooms and, and other areas are being cleaned frequently and, uh, and everyone is practicing very, very good hand hygiene. Um, and the, the thing to, to watch for is that we're not exchanging droplets that, that that sort of you know talking too close is not <clears throat> happening and um and you know because the virus is still spreading scarborough still has um a relatively um high rates when when you look at other areas of toronto so we want to be as careful as possible in stage two the province uh will be looking at the numbers um pretty much every two weeks to see what the effects are of each of the stages. And uh, if there's any concern, we could you know, lose some privileges if we have to, or just stay where we are and not advance on to stage three of the reopening. So we want to 
be as careful as possible to try to avoid that second wave. We're strongly discouraging care outside karaoke. Yeah. And actually, their entertainment isn't allowed on patios yet either. No, so. no dancing either. Yeah. Yeah. No dancing, no singing, and, and, no performances. No, singing. Don't yeah. get carried away. <laughs> no one has ever asked me to go in karaoke. Nobody. <laughs> the next question has to do with dining again, but this time it's in your home. Um, the question is, can I have people over for dinner in my home? If they are not in my ten personal social, my ten person social bubble, Liz, do you know the? Well, the answer would be you're supposed to have uh, the the guidelines are to have people within your bubble. Uh, so having people outside of your bubble, obviously, no one is going to police that. That's a risk <laughs> that you're taking on your own. And if you're doing that, I would encourage you to make sure that, again, people are masking and you're doing social distancing. But um, the, the guidelines are, again, follow our public health officials' guidelines to protect yourself as best you can. And then it's up to our own common sense. We all have uh, the opportunity to make decisions, but make them wisely. And uh, if, you know, if you're going to 11 people, make it wisely. If you're going to 50 people, I, I might I might rethink that. Uh, that's uh, not where we want to go. Uh, so I, I would follow the public health guidelines and and try to resist going outside of your bubbles. It's 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 not just uh, for the people you know the people you invite in on your bubble. It's you it, it's it expands exponentially. Uh, and so understanding how uh, those people that ten people are going on to the next ten people and there is an these bubbles expand. Uh, so I, I would encourage, strongly encourage people as best you can to really be patient and uh, follow the guidelines that are in front of us. Thank you. This question is for both uh, Liz and Mitzi. Are you recommending testing for children and families before returning to school and daycare? You want well, to go start with that? Um, well, I know that the provincial guidelines is not requiring that right now. Um, so there isn't a, a public health um, requirement for testing before children uh, return to daycare for the staff uh, that work there. Um, I believe for daycare that there is testing, but not for the children themselves. Uh, in terms of school, that's uh, that's also something that everyone is concerned about. And, um, you know, I want to just use this as an opportunity to say to all of the 2020 graduates, uh, for our community in Scarborough Guildwood. Uh, you made it. You graduated. Congratulations. We're so proud of you. And it has been, you know, a very difficult year for all of our students at all grade levels, but you did make it. And, uh, and I know that you'll move on to do great things. So for those returning to our, our schools in September, um, you know, right now the province has put out um, three three choices um, for, for parents and for school boards to make um, in terms of the return. There's going to have to be a lot of adjustment and changes to the classroom in order to accommodate students uh, as they return um, to, to, to classroom learning. Uh, but there is not a requirement right now for, for testing. I don't know, Liz, if you have more to say on that. The only thing I would add is that, you know, um, we're cutting trail in front of us as we're going. We're learning from other jurisdictions as we go. So I would encourage everybody to just, again, stay tuned to our public health officials. We are fortunate to have incredible experts in our province who are helping lead the way, keeping us advised on, on a daily basis, like not a weekly, not a monthly. When things are changing, they're, they're keeping us advised and expecting us to implement those changes. So. Right now, that is not a requirement. In August, it may be. They may have more information and feel that that's, that's a good thing to do. So um, stay, stay tuned, uh, keep alert, and uh, truly, I, I have all faith in our public health officials that are uh, paying attention to the latest science, the latest learnings, and adjusting our policies as we go. Thank you, Liz and Mitzi. 
this question is for all of our seniors. Um, at what stage will I be allowed to hold my mom's hand who lives in a long-term care facility currently not on outbreak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those again, uh, like like my earlier comments, the, the policies and practices, the, the public health officials are adjusting them as quickly as they can, ensuring we're as safe as we can be. So right now, uh, people can visit their loved one in a home not on outbreak, but obviously uh, still keeping social distancing. And, and we know that's incredibly uh, a, a very big burden on families. Uh, and some find it's actually helpful and some find it's actually more challenging. Uh, as soon as we can, and the public health officials, they're very empathetic about this, as soon as they can change those guidelines and feel that it's safe, for, for you to be able to hug your loved one, hold the hand of your loved one, uh, they will lift those. They, you know, all of us have lived experiences and they, they do too. Um, so they, they really are, are wanting to do the very best possible while realizing um, they need to be responsible for the greater good and making sure we're keeping everybody safe. So um, again, it's our policies and practices are changing on a regular basis. Uh, to open things up as quickly as we can. Right now, uh, we can get people to go see their loved ones in homes that are on not in outbreak, and hopefully soon we'll be able to uh, see them in a more uh, uh, intimate basis. Does anybody have anything to add to that? Well, that comes to the end of our segment with Liz. Liz, thank you so much for all of your informative questions. We will now open with questions to your representatives. Mitzi, this question's for you. With the reopening of schools and the proposed hybrid model, students attend part-time, won't there be an increased possibility of transmission when those students attend multiple different childcare locations on their days off? Thank you so much for the question. And, uh, and we know that there are lots of uh, concerns around the return to school and there's a lot of work that the school boards have to do to prepare. Um, I do want to go over the three the three options. So there's the full schedule uh, with enhanced safety measures um, such as uh, protocols for uh, social distancing within classrooms, uh, enhanced cleaning, um, even use of washrooms and lunchrooms and those types of things, uh, and activities. Um, you know, there might be more outdoor learning, uh, for instance, uh, so students can get outside. Those are some of the things that are being contemplated for the full return. There's the hybrid, which you're asking about, which is a rotating schedule with uh, limited numbers of students and uh, and obviously it has to do with strong coordination with uh, with students, parents, and the schools. And then there's home learning, which uh, which is what happened really since March uh, when the schools were were shut down. Um, and so those are the three the three options uh, that uh, that are out there right now. It remains to be seen what will happen in September. So I do. Um, see the, the challenges and the, the concerns that, that parents uh, will have. I think from, from my perspective as the former Minister of Education, it's, you know, how do we ensure that Ontario students are learning and learning to a high standard um, in the midst of this pandemic, because that is really important. Um, we don't want to lose time uh, for learning for students. And, you know, we also, know that family circumstances are different um, in, in every situation. So I think that's a, a very big, big concern is that we want the quality of education, the excellence that we have in, in our education system to be maintained. And then, of course, in an environment that is safe um, for the teachers and for staff, as well as for the students. Um, I do want to say that the, the standards in terms of public health um, in childcare and, and in our education system, there shouldn't be uh, variances in that. There, there should be um, uh, a, sa a safe space uh, in our childcare settings as much as there is within our school settings. Uh, so, so that's, um, that's something that that I would expect would be maintained, and uh, and then you know we do want to make sure that our students are getting the best education possible, even in the midst of of the global pandemic. 
Thank you very much, Mitzi. The next question is for Paul. What changes are being made for the city-owned long-term care homes to make them safe for our parents and grandparents? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. And that's something we've been working very hard at. And uh, when we look at our, we have 10 long-term care homes that the city of Toronto operates. And uh, the two words, that the process that I always talk about, I think we've started at a reactionary standpoint where we're trying to understand COVID and the impact that it had on our long-term care term care homes, our seniors and our staff. And we've we've moved into a very proactive stage where I think we've learned a lot from uh, from the early period of the COVID-19. We've learned about trends and the impact on PPEs in the equipment we need and the staffing, even the layout of our of our long term care homes. We've I think we've come a long way. Uh, most of the numbers of uh, both staff and uh, residents that are ill in our long term care homes has gone down quite a bit. Uh, you know, we have the proper equipment in place. Uh, we do temperature readings twice a day. Uh, as I said, you know, we've restructured the homes so there's more space. And but I think it's it's an ongoing ongoing lesson and, and learning experience. But I think we've come a long way. Thank you. I think, uh, and Antoinette, I think it'd be useful if uh, Liz jumped in here to talk about uh, her, um, uh, well, the Scarborough Health Network and its role in uh, Scarborough and uh, some, uh, should we say, supervisory responsibility with respect to uh, the uh, long-term care network, or not long-term care homes in uh, in Scarborough. I think, I think uh, our listeners would find it quite interesting. Sure. Uh, so there are 22 long-term care homes in Scarborough and we're overseeing 20 of them and that's just because they sit on the borders. So Michael Guerin oversees one and North York General oversees one of the others that sit on our borders. So we have 20, which is amongst the largest amount to be uh, helping to provide care for. I will say the municipal homes uh, have the lowest risks of all of our homes, uh, non-profit and for-profit uh, homes and uh, have quickly uh, been able to pivot and uh, readjust as, as uh, Councillor Ainsley was saying to uh, accommodate the needs of, of improved uh, infection prevention control practices, models of care practices, uh, patient flow practices. And so uh, one of the early homes that were in outbreak was Seven Oaks in, in Scarborough Municipal Home. and. Um, they were very quickly, very responsive. We worked very closely with them and we were able to uh, provide educational services around um, infectious prevention control, environmental services, uh, and physician services, including uh, palliative uh, medical care, mental health services, and also spiritual care services uh, for, for families and staff and residents. So uh, we, we actually have created a menu of, of options for all of the homes in Scarborough uh, for where they feel they need support. And as I mentioned earlier, we meet with them every uh, Thursday led by our, our Executive Vice President, Dr. Bert Lowers. He reviews all the recent uh, changes in policies in the province and or locally. Uh, but the municipal homes are, are uh, have been very, very responsive and very strong and are a good model. Uh, for us to work with. The others as well, we have oversight for two of, of the private homes right now, helping to manage and support them. Very collaborative relationships. I, I think overall, out of the 22 homes in Scarborough, we only have one in the yellow now. We've moved everybody almost all into the green and, and out of outbreaks. So we're in a, in a, good, in a good place working together. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. John, this next question is for you. Okay. What is the to date estimated future costs of COVID-19 related benefits, including grants, forgivable loans and other supports? <laughs> is there a plan being put in place for repayment of these expenses? I was kind of hoping that you'd come up with that, Annette. Um, <laughs> this is a massive amount of money. Uh, the uh, parliamentary budget office is at this point estimating 150 to 160 billion dollars in deficit spending. Um, to give you some perspective on what that means, 
um, that is roughly one half of the federal government's overall budget on an annual basis. So the annual budget of the federal government is um, is about three hundred billion dollars. We uh, we are going to deficit that by one hundred and fifty to one hundred sixty billion dollars. So that's a lot of money, <laughs> and the the federal government has um, a very major problem on its hands. Therefore, we have a major problem on our hands. Um, and it's twofold. The first is the um, sending out of all of that money, and it's been primarily uh, sent out under the Canada Emergency Response Benefits. So that was about a 60 billion item there, and the wage subsidy is another 45 billion. And, and after a while, these numbers just don't, don't mean anything to people because they can't relate to it. Uh, but um, suffice to say, it is a massive amount of money. So on the one hand, we're sending out a whacking big chunk of money. And on the other hand, the revenues are way down. And as you can appreciate, it, it, you, know, you just need to look around your neighborhood to realize why they're way down, because the economy contracted uh, significantly. Uh, people are unemployed. And when they're not working and when the economy is contracting, then there's no tax revenues. And if there's no tax revenues, you double your problem. So, um, uh, so come uh, come this time next year, we'll probably have a better feeling for what um, our economic and fiscal picture looks like. Uh, the government is uh, giving a statement uh, on July the 8th as to what uh, the current situation looks like, but uh, to be candid about it, it is an educated guess. Um, uh, you know, all of the benefits um, have been going out. That number, you know, you don't really know what the number coming in is going to be, and therefore, to give you a hard and fast uh, difference is is extraordinarily difficult. Um, we are going to be digging out of this hole for quite a number of years. And um, I have no real good insight as to how we're gonna dig out of this hole, um, other than we're gonna have to all do it together. Uh, the good fortune is that Canada was in uh, great fiscal shape uh, going into the pandemic um, with a debt to GDP under 30%. Um, we are probably going to be up around 40, 45 percent. So um, that's that's a huge change, and it's going to affect everybody in this phone call. So when Paul, on behalf of Ms. Pally, asks for money, uh, it's going to be difficult. When uh, Mitzi returns to government, we know that that'll happen sometime sooner rather than later. But even before she returns to government. Um, uh, the uh, current provincial government will be asking for money and uh, we will have to say we don't have any. And of course that has significant implications for uh, Liz's uh, budget uh, because um, healthcare is a very significant component of the provincial budget and, um, and uh, the hospital network will be of course uh, a significant component of the significant component. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we as Canadians, we as people from Scarborough have a, have a massive problem and I don't think I can underestimate uh, the problem and it will affect every one of us. There's your depressing answer for the day. <laughs> Friday night. Oh, yeah. John. You could have at least cracked open a beer or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we can't crack open champagne, that's for oh, sure. Yeah. Although we, the, the, if we continue the success rate that I think the public health authorities are having um, on uh, flattening that curve and, um, and uh, starting to get uh, a little bit better handle on COVID, and I think we may not be able to go to the champagne just yet, but we, we, might, we might be able to at least put it in the fridge. Thank you, John. The next question is for Mitzi. When will service Ontario centres reopen? So the good news on that one is that the majority of them as of June 24th have reopened. So 96% of those locations that are run um, that are public are, are open and 80% of those that are private locations are open. I do want people to remember though that 
online is also a great option and, and far lower risk to the staff that work at Service Ontario and for your interactions with the public. And so if you visit um, Ontario.ca um, and there's a service uh, search for the Service Ontario centres, uh, you'll be able to uh, do many of, of the um, services uh, online without having to to go in and also there's an extended uh, validity period for um, things like license um, plate uh, stickers and and that sort of thing because of the emergency uh, pandemic uh, as well so um, you know although those sites are open we're really encouraging people to um, take a look online to see if you can do what you need to do in that format and uh, and then you can get your sticker mailed out to you. And I can contest it works the online. <laughs> it works and it works really well. It works really well. Thank you, Mitzi. The next question is for Paul. When will municipal licensing standard law start enforcing complaints through 311 again? Okay, so thank you for that question. So our, our licensing staff, uh, we have a, a timeline of July when our licensing staff, in particular our property licensing uh, enforcement officers are going to be back to their regular jobs. We made a, a very concerted effort and a decision to decide to redeploy all of our licensing staff uh, into dealing with social distancing, uh, making sure uh, grocery stores uh, in particular uh, we're following all of the social distancing, uh, the, per the bylaw that was put in place around social distancing. But I do encourage people uh, because it is beautiful weather, everybody's out and about, you're in your neighborhoods looking at things, you're looking at the roads, unfortunately illegal advertising signs that are up, um, people are still uh, throwing garbage out and about which they shouldn't be. Um, but feel free to contact my office. We are keeping uh, a running tab and a total and a list of locations and concerns so that when our licensing staff are back online uh, in their pre-COVID-19 duties, uh, that we'll get as many issues cleaned up as quickly and efficiently as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. The next question is for John. In reference to the O. AS and GIS, the announcement mentions allowance recipients. Who are the allowance recipients? I'm given to understand the allowance recipients are the spouses of recipients who are between ages of 60 to 64. And as I understand it, uh, there will be an additional $500 available to them. Okay, thank you so much. That was very efficient, John. Well, every once in a while, I like to answer a question economically. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Your last depressing answer, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, it, it, you know, I can relate it to the last depressing answer because, <laughs> you know, this is a serious amount of money. I don't, I don't know how many GIS, OAS uh, recipients there are, but it's in, it's more than a million and it's probably closer to two million. And you, you end up, if you send up, uh, send out, $500 to a million people, it starts to add up very, very quickly. So, yeah. Anyway, so, but, but it is very well appreciated, John. I've, I've heard from a lot of seniors that uh, they're interested in municipal programming, but they do mention the federal ones as well. So I know they're very well appreciated. Well, they're also getting the HST credits as well. Uh, the juiced up HST credit, they got it, pre uh, they got it uh, early on in April. Um, so there's been a, quite a, a number of rollout programs, but you know, if I just go back to my uh, previous answer, the cost on the HST credits at this point is 5.5 billion. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's that, you know, those those are reality. So um, sorry, Antoinette, we turned an economically answered question into a, uh, a less lively discussion. Answered question. Yeah. I, I would just say I don't know about. I always get in trouble for in healthcare for using acronyms. So I don't know if everybody on the line knows OA, OAS is old age security and GIS is uh, general income supplement because uh, yeah. I didn't know until I texted David who's like there and I'm like, what are those things? How do, can I get some of that $500? Yeah. I can't yet. <laughs> no, no, no. 
<laughs> we'll move on to the next question. This one is for Mitzi. Uh, how is the government helping small businesses recover in the wake of COVID-19? Well, this is something that we really need to, to focus on. And, you know, when when John was speaking about the state of, of the the economy in Canada, you know, we also have a provincial lens as well. And, and the reality is um, from our original uh, economic forecast that our Minister of Finance put forward in March, was March 25th, to um, May and June, uh, the reforecast by the Financial Accountability Officer, uh, we lost $23 billion in revenues. And, uh, and that's part of the downturn in um, just less activity, uh, less uh, personal income taxes, less um, corporate uh, um, taxes being paid. And, and when you think about the fact that, um, you know, half of Canada's GDP is, is, is from small businesses, uh, you realize, you know, that we've got to really work hard in the recovery to make sure that small businesses they survive and that uh, that they are able to come back because they're major employers, major parts of our community. Uh, in Scarborough, we have many independently owned small businesses and, um, and you know, the Scarborough Business Association is doing a great job every month, uh, every week, sorry, of uh, bringing together the small business community for conversations uh, in terms of, you know, how can we support them? You know, many of them uh, want to see, for instance, um, support for rents. It's a it's a huge cost uh, for commercial rents, and uh, and they want to to see those programs. Uh, you know, there is a, a, a federal program that helps uh, with that, but it's dependent on the landlords participating, and landlords have been slow to participate. So that burden is is falling directly on our uh, small business owners and operators. And, and so that's a very big, big one. Uh, something that we did manage to get done provincially is uh, put a moratorium on ev evictions uh, for commercial uh, rents. And we've uh, the work from our Liberal Caucus and our, our uh, Green Party member uh, allowed the government to move that back to May 1st. And, uh, and so there is no, uh, you know, Landlords are not allowed to evict at this time during the pandemic, so that's helping small businesses. But but there's a there's a huge concern right now. Even though we're in stage two and and we're, we've opened, it doesn't mean that people are rushing back into those businesses. And uh, and so one of the things that um, it, I've held two roundtables uh, with with small business owners. And one of the things that became really, really clear is employee confidence. You know, believe it or not, how your employees feel about returning to work transfers into the confidence that they pass on to customers and they, they pass that on to suppliers. So I would really encourage small businesses to make sure that they involve their employees in the reopening stages, make sure they're comfortable, make sure the work environment um, is comfortable for those employees because that will go a long, long way in building the confidence that you're gonna need to uh, re-attract those, those customers. Um, uh, small businesses require liquidity. That's also an area. And while our provincial government has uh, has invested $17 billion into the COVID recovery, $10 billion of that is in tax deferrals. So things like deferring the uh, WSIB premiums and other types of uh, uh, payments to the to the government. And, and the concern that, that we have, and I've I, I actually asked a question this week of the finance minister and he said he was going to take it under advisement, you know, rather than having small businesses repay those deferrals in the fall, give them a year or more to, to repay so that uh, they can protect their liquidity as they're getting back up and, um, and make sure that they are strong enough in order to, uh, to pay those tax deferrals tax uh, deferrals. So those are just um, some of the areas, but there's a long way to go. Uh, when it, And you can think about this by each each sector, you know, you think about the, you know, the personal care, you know, hair salons and, you know, those types of things, barbershops are now opening, 
but they have to do that with social distancing. They have to invest more in PPE and sanitization. So the, their costs have gone up. In some instances, um, some of our restaurateurs are telling us that they have to hire more staff to serve less people because of the, um, the, 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 the new standards and the new guidelines. Um, I, sit on a, a committee that is listening, um, helping the government to um, to come up with a budget for the fall. And many, many, many operators are very concerned about the increased costs to meet the new guidelines. And where is that money coming from? So so there there's there's you know there's optimism and there's hope um, as we work together to to fight the pandemic but there's also many challenges ahead as well for our small business community. And we have to make sure that they survive in Scarborough. One of the things um, we're working on uh, with the Scarborough Business Association is you know, building pride in Scarborough and, and doing a Scarborough strong campaign that really encourages the local community to support local businesses because that's really the only way they're gonna survive is if, is if you support them. So Antoinette, just to pick up on Mitzi's comments about the revenues being down for the Ontario government. So I think you used the number 23 billion. So pretty well double that plus for the federal government. Um, and, um, and the significance of all of that is that Ontario is the engine of the Canadian economy. So if Ontario is down, the rest of the country is down um, to, a, to a large extent. And um, and the the and, and the uh, GTA economy is half of the Ontario economy. So when we're so when the GTA is the last to come out of the um, various protocols, um, it actually has a very significant ripple effect through the Ontario economy and through the Canadian economy because so much economic activity happens here in the in the GTA, and um, so we're. So ironically, the, the less quickly we come out, the less quickly the nation comes out. And that's all driven by the fact that, that um, uh, Toronto is not moving out of uh, the lockdown as quickly as maybe it, it could or should. Yeah, and, and I would just like to add, uh, along with John and Mitzi, is the city of Toronto, we do have a recovery and rebuild office that we uh, just recently created to support the business community as we're coming out of the, the COVID crisis. I'd encourage any business owners that are watching today, uh, if they go to the City of Toronto website, which is, it's easy, toronto.ca, uh, right on the homepage, there's a link to our COVID uh, information. We are doing a, a survey for businesses uh, to get their feedback and input on uh, how we can uh, help them and as a municipality to uh, give them that foundation they need uh, to successfully get out of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Paul, and it has business related as well. Uh, with the CAFE TO, um, Scarborough doesn't have many BIAs. Um, the question is, how will Scarborough restaurants be helped under the new CAFE TO program? Yeah, so uh, CAFE TO, it's a program that we've just created. It's, uh, it's, it's looking at restaurants and eating establishments and where we can add additional patio space uh, because... Uh, you know, as was mentioned earlier, the, the costs of uh, putting in the equipment and barriers and making sure your staff have the proper equipment so they are safe and, uh, and can pro properly serve their patrons. So we have a program in pay place called Cafe TO uh, to expand the patio areas and the eating areas outside the restaurants, taking advantage of uh, the good weather here. Uh, for myself as a, as a city councilor from Scarborough, one of the concerns that I raised is that one of the parameters of the program is uh, it's uh, money that goes to our business improvement areas that are throughout the city of Toronto. Unfortunately, here in Eastern Scarborough, we do not have a lot of business improvement areas because our businesses are mainly what I refer to as small businesses, mom and pop operations. Uh, so I have asked the city that we need to have some type of mechanism in place to support eating establishments that are not uh, included in business improvement areas because part of the cafe program as well, uh, many of our restaurants here in Scarborough have a parking lot uh, outside them. The whole idea behind Cafe Tiho is you can expand the patio space 
in front of your restaurant into the roadway uh, right in front of your building, uh, which often doesn't happen in Scarborough uh, because they're on private property with a parking lot, a boulevard, a sidewalk, and another boulevard. Uh, so they don't really fall into the guidelines of CAFE TO. What we have actually need to be doing is we have to change zoning bylaws. So we have actually asked the provincial government, uh, the finance minister for what's called a, an ordering council, so that uh, the zoning bylaws can be done by individual councils and not have to wait for provincial approval. So uh, we are doing everything we can to support uh, businesses. Uh, we look to the province for some help, uh, but certainly want to get our restaurants up and going again, uh, making sure that people can enjoy the patios and uh, get out, follow the rules and be safe and uh, support our local economy. Thank you. That's really, that's really good. I, I wanted, to, first of all, I absolutely would support uh, the <clears throat> request. Um, and as the finance critic for the Liberal Party, I'll probably mention to the finance minister that uh, I completely support the request from the City of Toronto um, to to really give the, the zoning flexibility right now during the pandemic uh, so that you can do what you need to do. I want to also say because you know, the provincial government has set up Ontario Live and it's for um, festivals and attractions and, you know, there are different um, uh, types of initiatives that are being posted there and, and the whole focus is to boost uh, local and domestic tourism, given the fact that the borders are closed and, um, you know, many of the attractions, you know, like the zoo and, you know, the Guild Park with uh, the Guild Festival Theatre and uh, and many of our, our attractions are not going to benefit from having um, the same level of activity that they would normally have. So Ontario Live is, uh, is, is really geared towards it, you know, letting people know what is going on in in Ontario, so that they can um, get the support of uh, of domestic tourism as well. So I would encourage any of our operators to sign up for that to get the exposure because it's there. The site has been built. I, I went on it actually. It's it's quite good, and um, and I also want to give a shout out to the Guild Festival Theatre for being so innovative and creative, um, doing porch plays, pop-up plays, and uh, and with the hope of doing a drive-in play in August. And, and I think that that's the kind of creativity and innovation and resilience that we need to see um, so that we can survive this very difficult year and start planning for next year. I would just throw a plug in for the zoo too. I think they've done an amazing job of being creative with their drive through And I saw tonight online that they're actually opening up to the public tomorrow uh, yep. to actually physically walk through again. So anyone who's listening who can get to the zoo, be outside, it's it's open again. So yes, yeah. it, we've had really creative businesses. And, and I would also say from the small business side as Scarborough Health Network, the innovation, uh, and support that we've had from small businesses in Scarborough has been just tremendous in uh, re sort of shifting their business um, templates to help support whether it's been with uh, masks or or face shields or hand sanitizers any way they can help is been just tremendous uh, it's it's really been heartwarming to see how the communities come together so strong thank you I also would like to note is the Guild Alive with Culture Festival is going to be online this year starting July 1st. Um, that is a festival that uh, Councillor Ainsley um, hosts the community. John, this question is for you. Early this month, the federal government issued a statement that they will grant a one-time payment of $600 to persons with disabilities holding a disability tax credit certificate. May we know the status of this? Uh, it's not very good. Um, that was part of a budget proposal of about $87 billion in spending uh, that was put before the House um, and uh, the agreement among the parties to pass that bill uh, fell apart uh, with uh, the, um, uh, with the um, uh, falling apart. Um, then that legislation didn't pass and if the legislation didn't pass then the tax credit won't um, won't um, go forward uh, and so at this point we are in a bit of a limbo I believe 
that uh, Parliament is scheduled to resume for a one day sitting in July. The date escapes me right now. I think it's around the 20th um, and um, possibly at that point the legislation will pass. Thank you, John. Mitzi, this question. You want question. another depressing answer? No, no more. <laughs> Who invited him? I know. For goodness sakes. He comes, he comes with the trio. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like I'm Debbie Downer, you know? Like for goodness sake. Every Friday night with you guys. <laughs> yeah, I, well, as you know, no one invites me out for karaoke. <laughs> I, I, I do want to say, John, that on a, on a happy Canada Day, July 1st note, that I do see your happy your happy Canada Day lawn signs popping up around uh, Scarborough Guildwood. So I think that's a great initiative for people uh, to support uh, you know, our national holiday. We, and we, uh, we were, good on you. We were actually out today uh, delivering signs um, uh, to uh, the various people that had requested them. However, we drew the line at uh, going to Mississauga. Somebody from <laughs> Mississauga wanted to know if you want that sign, <laughs> you're going to have to come to uh, Scarborough Guildwood, which of course, as we all know, is the center of the universe. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Despite your disclaimer, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is for Mitzi. How are you helping renters facing difficulties during COVID? I mean, this is definitely the the issue that has that came to the forefront in March, really, when the stay at home and the lockdown was required and people couldn't go to to work. And, you know, it really hit um, many individuals um, that are struggling to pay the rent. A lot of service jobs, for instance, were the first to to be closed down. You know, not everyone has a job where you can work from home and, and see no interruption in in your income. You know, um, thankfully, the federal government uh, with the CERB um, the, and, uh, and other programs uh, helped to provide, you know, some income to people, but still it was probably less than what uh, they would normally earn. And, and so we've been um, lobbying the provincial government to do uh, what other jurisdictions uh, like BC, uh, for instance, gave $500 uh, to, to tenants uh, to help offset the cost of, of rent. Uh, but so far, there hasn't been um, uh, rent relief uh, for residential tenants um, in in the province. Uh, there is uh, there are, there are no um, evictions happening at the landlord and tenant board, uh, so so there is that uh, relief there. But uh, but in terms of sort of cash uh, payments uh, to renters, uh, that has not happened provincially. Um, we continue to call on the government to recognize the plight of renters. You can see in Scarborough, the food bank use has gone way up. It was all already high, um, you know, we, we know that, but it has gone uh, way up with a lot of first time food bank users because they just sim simply are not able to, um, to make ends meet uh, during this uh, very, very challenging time. So. So it is a, it's an area that um, that remains um, a challenge uh, as long as uh, things remain sort of in this slower recovery stage. We, you know, we, we haven't uh, seen, you know, everyone go back to work yet. Um, there's over 2.2 million Ontarians who either have lost their job or they've seen a very drastic reduction in their jobs. And so, um, so giving relief for rent is, is something that would help many, many, many people. Thank you, Mitzi. The next question is for Paul. Are community drop boxes open for drop offs and where can residents drop off old electronics, TVs and computers? Yeah, so, so at this point, uh, you'll see the community drop boxes throughout Scarborough, uh, still have the yellow tape around them. Uh, they are not open at this point. Um, once, as we continue into stage three, I think you'll see them open. Um, but we do have seven what are called transfer stations around the city, and um, they're fully open. Um, and for things like electronics, batteries, anything like that, um, you can look at online uh, for the pickup days in your community for garbage. Um, but uh, any recycling that needs to be done in terms of electronics 
electronics can be put out at the curb and uh, we'll get it picked up. And for larger items, they can be dropped off at our uh, transfer stations. So uh, thank you for that questions as well. Thank you very much, Paul. This uh, will be our last question for the evening, uh, followed by a message from each of our representatives in guest. John, this question is for you. Is the federal government looking at supplementing support for child care? Well, the main supplement for support for child care is the Canada Child Benefit. And the Canada Child Benefit in scarborough Gilwood means $100 million a year uh, coming into uh, scarborough Gilwood. It is actually, uh, the, the riding is actually the largest recipient of, of the Canada Child Benefit in the country. And so you've got better end of $8 million coming in on a monthly basis into the hands of parents. And of course, it's a... Um, uh, a welcome amount of money. Um, there was a, a one-time shot in what, April or May, I believe, announced in April, check arrived in, in May uh, to, uh, to help uh, families through the uh, COVID um, experience. And, um, and I'm, a, I'm a big fan because it puts money in the hands of the people that need it the most and it will be spent locally. So, um, a mother, a father, a, f a family that receives a thousand or two thousand dollars in their bank account on a on a uh, monthly basis spends the money on children's clothes, spends the money on children's shoes, spends the money on education, uh, spends the money on food, um, and things of that nature. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's it is not childcare per se, but it is substantial family, um, uh, substantial uh, help to a family, and they will in turn uh, spend the money in a, in a way that uh, is most beneficial to that particular family in that particular circumstance. I do want to jump in as well um, in terms of, of the need for child care as part of the economic recovery. You know, I've, I've called this a she, a she session because when you look at, um, you know, the loss of many of those jobs, those service jobs, many of those jobs were held by women. And when you look at the, the statistics on the on the uh, recession, it's, it's women that have borne the brunt. As the economy is recovering, actually most of the jobs that are, are coming back quicker are male dominated industry jobs. Um, you know, your infrastructure, construction type jobs. In fact, construction never really closed fully. And so um, so that's a that's a big concern and childcare is very much um, a part of, of that in terms of giving uh, families the choice of, uh, of returning to work, who returns to work, uh, when school comes back, how does uh, our child care um, meet the needs of, of those families? And we're not going to fully recover from this re recession with, without um, child care being, being a factor. Um, it's been a little bit of a bumpy opening in, uh, in Ontario because uh, child care operators are still waiting for uh, funding that, uh, that they've demanded because all of those new standards that we've talked about for all the sectors also affects the child care sector. And, uh, and where do those costs come from? Do those costs be passed on to those families by increasing the cost, which was already very high, or is it government uh, that would assist in providing some funding so that those new standards can be met um, and, and we can maintain spaces? So there is um, a risk here in, in our reopening if we don't get childcare right. And so raising questions about childcare, I welcome those questions into my office. We've written to the minister um, over the course of the pandemic uh, to talk about concerns around childcare and, and we'll continue to advocate for more better childcare and investments in that. Thank you very much. With this, we'll start with our closing remarks. Liz, we'll start with, our, with yourself as our guest. Well, thank you again for the privilege of joining you this evening. I really uh, appreciated the questions and uh, have a good understanding of some of the uh, concerns that out there are out there. We'll continue to try to provide the best information as expediently as possible uh, for the community. And again, I would just encourage people 
Please know your healthcare facilities are safe and available to you. Please use our emergency departments. Don't stay away. Uh, we do have two assessment centers. Please uh, get tested. Uh, they are standalone and they're safe as well. And please continue, be patient, practice your social distancing, wash your hands and uh, wear your masks in public spaces. And uh, be safe, be well, uh, have a great uh, weekend and uh, happy Canada Day as well as uh, Councillor Ainsley uh, started to mention this evening. Thank you. And thank you so much, Liz, for joining us. Uh, this is our third virtual town hall that we've done um, as the, represented, the elected representatives for Scarborough Guildwood. And I have to say, it's been a joy having you on with us and um, you're welcome back anytime. Oh, yes, and I do want to, you know, um, say to our residents uh, in Scarborough Guildwood and uh, across Scarborough and, and Ontario, frankly, who uh, will be watching and, and, you know, you've been really, really incredible. The, the fact that we are in stage two of the recovery has been because of your sacrifice and staying at home, um, following the advice of public health and uh, and all of the, the, the sacrifices that you've made. That's why we are at the stage that we are in right now. Um, but we're not through the pandemic yet. And Scarborough remains a hotspot. It remains uh, an area that we have to be really careful about. So if you are venturing into areas that you can't physically distance, remember to wear a mask. Um, if, if you need a mask, uh, maybe reach out to us and uh, we'll try to, to find a way to connect you with that type of protective equipment. Um, you can just wear a scarf as well. Any covering of your face uh, will protect you and others and, uh, and keep you as safe as possible. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's important that we, we get through the next uh, few months as healthy uh, as possible and as safely as possible. So I too wish you uh, a great uh, a great weekend. Enjoy it. Uh, get outside and enjoy the fresh air. Um, it is time for us to do that now and do it safely. And uh, and happy Canada Day. And I want to thank my colleagues um, John McKay and Councillor Ainsley. It's really wonderful working together with you in common cause here in Scarborough Guildwood. So thanks everyone. Happy Canada Day. Thank you, Paul. Would you like to sign off? Oh, okay. I was going to defer to my federal counterpart. Up to you. John? No, no deferral necessary, Paul. I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll uh, do bad. I'll back clean up. <laughs> you see the following of instructions here that happens with these two. I was only deferring because he he always writes the checks, which I appreciate <laughs> as a municipal yeah. government. Yeah. Uh, okay. John, um, I want to start off by thanking Liz, uh, Liz Buller, the CEO of the Scarborough Health Network. Liz, for all your tremendous work and uh, leadership at all three hospital sites here in Scarborough. You know, having over a quarter of the population. In the GTA, you know, healthcare I think is always of paramount importance to everybody. And if you can pass on our thanks to all the uh, frontline healthcare workers at all three sites, I think uh, you know we can't thank them enough for everything that they do. And I'd also like to give a shout out to your uh, the Scarborough Health Network Foundation. Um, you know, if you want to give some financial support to those frontline workers and everything that they do. We have a tremendous uh, foundation at the Scarborough Health Network. Uh, I want to thank John and Mitzi for uh, another town hall. I think this is very reflective of the love that all three of us and care that all three of us have for the Scarborough Guildwood community. And I want to thank the residents for the questions that they've sent in. And, and once again, encourage everybody to follow the social distancing guidelines that we have in place. Uh, for your safety and our community's safety. And I want to uh, wish everybody uh, a wonderful, happy Canada Day and um, enjoy your time with your with your friends in your social bubble. <laughs> thank you. So apparently I'm bad in cleanup. I, I really don't want to thank anybody for those questions. I feel like I'm, I'm Debbie Downer for, uh, for this crowd. Uh, the, um, 
Uh, but uh, the questions were difficult, and apparently there's a few others that are even more difficult. It's been a, it's been a delight to have Liz with us. Um, I, I don't quite know that everybody appreciates what a real uh, asset uh, we in Scarborough have in Liz Buller and the Scarborough Health Network. Um, it is um, a very significant health network. My recollection is it's the third largest health network in Ontario. And, um, and it uh, serves us well, and it's serving us even better as it um, uh, takes over some supervisory responsibility with respect to the long-term care um, homes. So um, I, uh, I have some confidence that um, if and when we have a, um, a second wave, that we are much better prepared. So I wanna thank Liz and the Scarborough Health Network for that. And the other, I wanna thank Mitzi and Paul as well. Um, one of the reasons we uh, do this is uh, not only to hear your concerns, but to uh, show a level of cooperation among the, the three levels of government. Um, I know these guys are always asking for money, but they actually are nice people, not notwithstanding that. Um, we are, um, uh, we are uh, coming up to Canada Day, uh, and I think um, uh, this has been, 2020 has been an, an, a year of immense challenge. Um, and it's not just been the pandemic. Uh, there's been other challenges that uh, we've had to face as a nation. Uh, yet um, uh, it is uh, it is a, a day in which we reflect that we live in the best nation on earth, and we are very fortunate and blessed people. So on that note, happy Canada Day, everyone. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Thank you. Happy Canada Day. <laughs>